Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grote, I your host for this program. Welcome, welcome. Uh, uh, we are in this week in which all around America, we, uh, we pray for women, husbands, fathers, and children, and for the courage to make the right decision when it comes to life. And so let's, let's keep this very important issue before us in our prayer as we think about all those around the nation, not only walking for this issue, standing up for this issue, but all the, the mothers and fathers who are faced with a difficult decision, given difficult situations, they need to have our care and our prayer. So we do that. I encourage you to do that, especially everything you can at the local level. Once again, it's a privilege to join you on this program. Our guest tonight is Joshua Bowman. He's a former Episcopalian and Anglican, and it is great to have you with us, Joshua. Yes, thank you. It's, it's great to great. be in the program. Uh, you, you're a blogger, and you spend a lot of your time on the internet. Uh, cracks me up a lot of times on the internet. We read things we don't know who always behind it. You know, we, we lose track of who was writing that if we're drawn to a certain topic, but you write for uh, CatholicVote.org, and we might get to that later on. Yeah. But as you, if you watch the program, you know the first thing I want to do is get out of the way as soon as I can, and I invite you to start from the beginning and mm -hmm. let us have a little bit of your journey. Yeah, so really, you know, I was raised uh, Episcopalian. We went to church every Sunday, and, you know, I went to Sunday school being a little kid. Uh, so, you know, we sang lots of songs, you know, Jesus Loves Me, you know, <laughs> and, you know, we, I remember we reenacted Joshua marching around the walls of Jericho with a bunch of cardboard blocks. And I thought that was great because I'm Joshua, so <laughs> making the walls come tumbling down. And, you know, so we learned a lot of the Old Testament stories, but, you know, of course it's Sunday school, so you don't get the sort of the harder edges of the story. You know, it's sort of a simplified, sing-songy kind of version. So A little bit of hagiography at times. In other words, you're getting the, right. the best, the virtuous... Right, you get you, you get, don't hear the bad side of David in his in right or of Abraham. You know, you don't get you don't get sort of some of the things he did wrong. You just yeah. get the you get the nice, neat sort of package, and so you know, that was fine. And I always, you know, that was just part of growing up was going to Sunday school. And it was great. We would have brunch after services. We'd go to the the Hilton and. I'd always get extra helpings of bacon, you know, it was, it was fun, you know, it was a nice way to spend Sunday morning. Um, but as I got older, I really sort of, it didn't keep me, it didn't, I didn't grip me. Um, and was so, there a disconnect between what you did on that wonderful Sunday experience and the rest of life? Absolutely. I mean, it was. I mean, we were, we were just, we went to church and then we walked out the door and we went to brunch. And then we got on with the rest of our lives. Yeah. It was it was sort of a, a an apostrophe in the week. It wasn't we weren't you know we weren't sitting around at home reading scripture. Sometimes we did you know on like Christmas we would read from Luke. You know we would on special occasions we might get out the Bible and sort of dust it off and <laughs> and pick some choice passages. But for the most part, you know, six days a week we were just going on with our lives. And so you know, especially as I got into school. And, you know, other, other activities and just, just a lot going on. Church didn't really grip me and keep me. So by the time I was, you know, I guess 10, 11, 12, uh, in the Boy Scouts, um, there's a religious program, you know, yeah. big part of Boy Scouts is serving God. Mm -hmm. um, and so I took the class for the religious medal and each, you know, each medal is specific to your denomination. So as an Episcopalian, we went and met with the priest, um, you know, we had several sessions. And at Marina, we, we took a tour of the church and we learned about, you know, different sort of different things in the liturgy and stuff like that. And then we would also have sort of these very um, sort of small groups meeting with directly with the priest in his office, you know, talking about more theological type questions. <laughs> Excuse me. Bless you. Yeah. Uh, and so I remember very clearly there was one day where I was, you know, very easily distracted as a child and I was leaning over and like drawing on the carpet with my fingers, you know, the piles moving back and forth and <laughs> changing from light to dark. And I was just 
tuned out, you know. And my dad was like nudging me like, Josh, pay attention. Like, this is the priest, you know, he's talking. <laughs> and I, I was very ashamed, you know. I, but I, at the same time, it just, you know, my soul did not really burn <laughs> for the faith. And I, it just didn't grip me. So the big crisis sort of came. I, in one of these sessions, my dad was asking about a near-death experience that he had many years earlier. And it seemed, you know, I don't rem really remember exactly what the priest said, but it wasn't satisfactory for my father. From based on his experience, you know, he wanted something. He was looking for some kind of solace. But what the priest said was not what he was looking for. I don't know. It's a long time ago. <laughs> but uh, at that, at that, at that was really sort of a crisis. Um, <laughs> You know, maybe in my father's faith, I don't know, but certainly in my faith, um, to see, you know, sort of my, my father, who is my role model, and I, I still look up to him very much and, and respect him a great deal, but to have him in opposition with what the church is saying uh, was, as a, you know, as a child, was very challenging. Um, was it because, I'm wondering here, was it because your father's near-death experience had a more conservative conclusion than what the priest was trying to put on it kind of a thing? I, you know, I don't know. I don't mean, remember, but, but whatever it was. I don't really, you know, it's, my father never really could explain it yeah. in a way that I could understand. And he tried, you know, he would, and he's very good at, he's a good storyteller, but, you know, I, I think it's something that only people who have ever yeah. had this yeah. can really understand what it is. Certainly, I, I've never had that experience. So, it's, 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 really impossible for me to understand what he went through right. and this is before I was born even so yeah. um, what, whatever explanation he got it just it didn't mesh with his experience yeah. okay. and so who am I you know who am I to argue with my father yeah. if he says this is what I this is what happened I mean this is what I felt I felt you know some God was there somehow and the priest is maybe saying you know well you know we, you weren't in heaven if you're in heaven, you can't come back. You know, maybe something like something along those lines. Yeah. Um, and it just so that 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 sort of conflict there um, was, I would say, the beginning of my crisis of faith. Yeah. Is how do I understand this? Yeah. You know, this and you know, as a child, I didn't know to ask. You know, I didn't know to explore the difficulties that I had. It just sort of it, I was not really eager to learn more about it anyway. You know, I was a punk kid, right? So <laughs> at that point is when I sort of began to fall away. And especially, you know, my father stopped going to services with us. We stopped having our nice little brunch with the extra helpings of bacon. And it just, it, it got to be less fun. Because now when you're older, you have to go to services. You don't get to go, you don't get, get to, go to Sunday school anymore, which is, of course, backwards. But we can get into that later. <laughs> But, you know, so having to go to services, and I was an antsy little, you know, very distracted child, and so that just made it even less pleasant to go to church on Sunday. And it wasn't a big part of my life. So by the time I got to high school, really, I was, you know, Episcopal in name only. You know, we didn't go to, we didn't go to services hardly ever. Maybe, maybe on Christmas, maybe on Easter, if we felt like it. You know, it was, it was very... Unfortunate, very sad, but that was sort of my my formation, um, and the the beginning of my journey away <laughs> from from Christ. So, I mean, it does sound like you know you emulate your father, and if your father reaches out with with a truly powerful experience that he had had, looking for a confirmation, <laughs> whatever the priest said. Right. So nah, that was, you had you had a bad pickle or something. Said so, no, no, no. That wasn't it. Right. It was real. Right. Well, you know. But there you are trying to understand, and then eventually it doesn't connect at all. And which right. just happens so often when, as we, when when the Sunday doesn't connect with the rest of the week. Right. So easily. Absolutely. So after high school, you're you're right. not engaged at all. So I was by the time I graduated from high school, I had thoroughly immersed myself in the very, you know, 
classical liberalism, this very, you know, deist, Whiggish kind of mentality that, you know, what has God ever done for me lately? You know, God created the universe and here we are and he, 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 he's out of the picture, right? You know, I was an arrogant teenager. I thought I was invincible, you know, very, very foolish, obviously. Um, you know, I, you know, I loved the, you know, reading you know, Locke and, you know, the Greek philosophers, you know, who are just sort of, man is the measure of all things, you know, we are, we're here, you know, this is, this is our world. And that was my view, you know, that was my view is that we're here to, you know, subjugate the earth and, you know, bend it to our will and create things out of nothing, you know, this very brutal kind of romantic philosophy. So, you know, I, I, when I got to college, um, I went to Virginia Tech and, you know, it's just a few miles down the road from Lynchburg. So there's, you know, a lot of my classmates were very strong evangelical, you know, uh, Protestants who really, you know, were very, very public and very, you know, active on campus spreading the gospel, you know, and they had tents on the middle of campus every day going to class. You'd pass by the Campus Crusade for Christ, and, you know, they would <laughs> always be out there trying to convert people. And of course, me, my arrogant self then, I was, just my heart got harder and harder. <laughs> every time I would walk by them, I would just think terrible things about them. You think, oh, these idiots, they're, they're so, they're simpletons, you know, what do they know? And I, I would never stop and talk to them. I mean, I wouldn't, I just, I just didn't want to hear what they had to say. Oh. And I mean, it, it was, and I could just, you know, I, I, I look back and I can just feel like how my heart was growing cold and hard in those years. Um, and it was, um, you know, I, I was probably a very terrible and obnoxious person to be around in, in those days. I mean, I, I had several friends who, I, I stopped talking to because I was just so obnoxious to them. And, you know, I, I, I'm looking at this beautiful picture of St. Peter's, you know, I, there, I got in an argument with one of my friends and I said, just, just nuke the Vatican, you know, it's, it's just causing trouble for the world, you know. <laughs> and it was, I, I almost weep thinking of it now, but at the time I was just nasty to a lot of my friends because of their Christian beliefs. Our guest today is uh, Joshua Bowman. Joshua, you think that? That attitude is a natural trajectory, progression of that kind of philosophy that you had so seeped yourself in. I think so. I mean, you look at the Enlightenment, and as Americans, you know, we, we have benefited from the Enlightenment. There's no question about that. A lot of important th thinkers and, you know, very important principles that this country is founded on sprang from the Enlightenment. Right. But so did the French Revolution, so did the September massacres, so did, you know, the, you know, the beheading of thousands of priests, I think, were, were slaughtered in the French Revolution. And that is the Enlightenment. That is what yeah. the Enlightenment was all about, uh, f expressed fully. And, you know, we're still living with the consequences of this today. I mean, you look at Europe, and it, it is the shadow of the French Revolution, the crisis in Europe of so many people who have fallen away from the church um, and this very sort of materialist culture, all of that flows from the Enlightenment, yeah. um, from that time, the, you know, the 18th century philosophy. You know, I'm not a philosopher. I don't know, I don't know right. all yeah, the names. I. <laughs> so I can't quote you anything, but I can, I can definitely see, you know, myself even just being exposed to those ideas in that very delicate and wounded period of my life it no. it was a a path i don't know you sort of fork in a path and i definitely chose the no. rationalist materialist path and it was very ultimately very painful for me um yeah if we if we recognize that even in scripture it does emphasize that that god created man as the pinnacle of his creation that was intended to draw us to humility Yes. And gratefulness and thankfulness, but as the Enlightenment kind of expanded on that idea of man being the pinnacle of everything. Right. 
But then when you take God out of the equation, right. there you are. Right. Man can do anything that he wants and ought to do anything he wants, and can, even to the point of it's our responsibility to uh, make sure that the human genome is as pure as possible by right. by killing people whose genes are not as good as we think they are. Absolutely. And so we have the euthanasia and, and all that. Yeah, the uh, and, eugenics and and this is uh, you know sadly, very sadly, eugenics is perhaps America's greatest export to the world. These ideas that percolated in the Enlightenment and found expression in the late nineteenth, early twentieth century was it was commonplace to yeah. sterilize people and even you know you, you the holocaust in germany began with killing euthanizing people who had mental disabilities right. and people who were severely disabled uh physically and that's how it started and these ideas still have really subconsciously warped our culture even today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people will come up to my wife uh, at, at the library or at the grocery store and just say, oh, wow, you know, your kids are awfully close. Like, what were you thinking? <laughs> like, well, we wanted to have kids. Isn't that normal? But for a lot of people, it's not normal yeah. to have two kids within 18 months of each other. They think that you must be an idiot. You must... You know, yeah. it's not a choice for us. We are just instruments of God's will. We are not the ones who can control life and death. God controls life and death. We are just blunt instruments. You know, we're... Well, we're, we're children of a loving Father. That yes. We offer out of filial love right. our lives. And if God desires by grace to to fill up the, the, the quivers of our lives full of children, then that's a blessing from God. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, as opposed to the other, that it's, it's our complete control, which is what the end of the result of the Enlightenment, as you right. said. And what you're saying is that this would have been your thinking at that point in college. Oh, yeah. I, w I mean, I certainly, I mean, I, I remember I was a big proponent of eugenic ideas, maybe not killing people, but certainly I thought, you know, this is... This is the perfectibility of mankind. Let's take this seriously. It, it has real world implications beyond just educating yourself and you know, formulating your mind. It's also society as a whole. In order to perfect, perfect society, at least you know, according to those ideals, you know, things like abortion make perfect sense. That's a logical consequence of that philosophy. And, so I was, of course, I was pro-choice. You know, I thought, well, I personally, the doctor told my mother that she should have an abortion because the, some test came back and said that I would be mentally d disabled. And she said, no, I, I'm not going to do that. This is my child. Um, but even with that, even with my own birth <laughs> being a choice that my mother chose brightly, thank, thankfully, yeah. um, you know, I was still pro-choice. I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm not a woman. Why? It's none of my business, right? Which is, of course, we can get into that later. But, <laughs> uh -huh. I mean, that I was so immersed in this idea that, you know, people, the sort of the, the rights of the individual are supreme. And, you know, it's, it's not only a right, but a duty to, to perfect yourself and to be this temple of reason, you know. And... And that I viewed religion as the enemy, as an encroachment on these things. So, what was the, your trajectory at this point in college? Was this all this thinking leading to the, your, what you're perceiving as a call to your life? Or, uh, you know, I, that's the thing. In college, I didn't really have direction. I didn't see myself going anywhere. You know, I didn't have a plan, and. Well, I still don't. I mean, I still leave things up to God. But, but um, no, I mean, I, it, in a way I was, even though I was so sure of myself, I was also completely adrift. It's sort of paradoxical, although not really. Um, and, and so, of course, when I was at college, the big, the big wake-up call was September 11th. Um, 
that was the moment where I said, well, this is, this is really bad. You know, my whole philosophy, my whole view of the world is based on the goodness, you know, the natural goodness of the individual and the, that people will always do what is rational and, and that, you know, that when this happened, September 11th, and I thought, well, these are people, how could they do this? It doesn't make any sense. It's irrational. And that's when I really had to confront the problem of evil, is people sometimes do not behave rationally. And that's why we talk about eugenics, we talk about the, the slaughter of the French Revolution, is because people are not rational, and people do not follow this philosophical program, not everyone agrees, and nor should they. Um, so you see in September 11th that the fanatics who carried out the attacks, they had the same idea, is if people disagree with us, well, we have to kill them, because they, they're not with our program, right? I mean, that's what it boils down to, is this very, you know, this very unfortunate idea that we all have to agree, number one, and that reason dictates, you know, re if you follow reason alone, then it's pretty, it's pretty simple. There's only one end, and that is murder. You know, it's, it's very unfortunate. Yeah. Um, so that, that's when I you know, woke up from this delusion that I had sort of wrapped myself in, that, that as a human being that I was supreme and my reason could solve every problem. I had, I was completely wow. helpless hmm. and I had no answers and I, I, I just could not come to grips with this. So I started keeping a journal um, and try, trying to explore this, you know, in my reading, you know, st you know, outside of classwork, I would just read, hmm. you know, I was really into still, you know, the classical liberal philosophy. So I read um, John Stuart Mill, and you know, he is of course no friend of religion. You know, he had some very nasty things to say about the Catholic Church especially. And you know, as I was reading this, I was keeping notes and writing my journal, and in, in, you know, I was still very much in the grip of this, but at the same time it also was a turning point for me where I had to confront that man is not good, well, m or not all good, I should say. Man, man is also tempted. Yeah. Man is is susceptible to evil, and we always have to be vigilant, you know, in the face of the devil. Um, so, in a way, I guess you could say. So, I had rejected Christ completely. I, you know, I was, I would consider myself a deist at that time. I had never fully rejected God, but I had sort of fooled myself into thinking that Satan was not just around the corner. So I would say, I guess on September 11th is when I had to confront, there is, yes, there's a God, but there is also Satan. And there is a, there is a reality there, that evil is always lurking, and that reason will not protect you from the devil. Because if you... If you disbelieve in the devil, then you're prone to the whispers. Exactly. You can't know. Absolutely. And unless you have some trustworthy guide to help you discern whether that's a good whisper or a bad whisper, right? then you're prone to decide, as you said, you know, right. I, what I believe is right. That person doesn't believe what I do, so I can have every right to kill them for the good of society or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. thing. So, you know, if you rely on your brain alone to solve problems, well, the devil is smarter than you are, I guarantee you. <laughs> the, you know, the only, the, the only intelligence greater than the devil is God. You know, devil, the devil is not a supreme intelligence, but he's very cunning and very smart, and he will win. You know, you look at uh, the story of Faust, you know, Faust did not outsmart the devil. His redemption in the story is because of God not because of his own wits, you know. Um, and speaking of Faust, so that was actually another important thing in, in college, was my love of music. 
So um, I sang in the choir, and we uh, we did um, Mahler's second symphony, which is very epic choral part of the end. And I got tuned into that, and then I everybody said, "Oh, well, if you like Mahler, you need to listen to the eighth symphony, the Symphony of the Thousand." And the second half of that symphony is the story of Faust. It is the story of his redemption. Um, and, you know, on his ascent to, I guess, purgatory or heaven or whatever, he has to encounter all the people that he's injured in his life. And it ends with this, this very, this wonderful, this wonderful sort of vista of, I guess, the Empyrean light. And the, the woman who he injured, like his deepest injury was right there to greet him and say, you, you, you know, there is mercy. There's, there's, there's a second chance here. And it's just the music is, is spellbinding. Not, not everybody likes Mahler. <laughs> um, so of course the other, the other really big piece uh, was Mozart's uh, great mass in C major, which he wrote as a wedding present for Constanza. Uh, he didn't finish it, which is not to say he didn't love her, but he just had other projects that he wasn't getting paid to write the great mass, unfortunately, for us. So he left it unfinished. Um, but the, he did write the, the Credo, uh, and in the middle is you know, the Incarnatus Est. And this, this, this very bombastic and glorious music, very majestic, of the credo and the very like very sort of almost martial music gives way to this very just elusive soprano line that that just seems to like fly away from you and, and it just it, it's it's painful to listen to it's painful because it's so perfect and so beautiful and you you know i don't know we can speculate about Mozart's religious beliefs. Some say he was a Freemason, but he was also raised Catholic, so it's hard to say uh, where he, exactly he right. stood. But it's impossible to argue that that music is not divinely inspired. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe he wasn't, maybe he didn't believe it, but certainly God had a hand in mm -hmm. his music, especially his sacred music. And something just so, I mean, it sort of makes me lump in my throat just thinking about it. It's just yeah. a beautiful passage. And, and I obviously didn't sing the soprano part. But we sang in the choir th that piece um, one, one year, and it just it stuck with me as this is, this is something special. You know, I didn't necessarily believe in what the credo was saying, but something important happened there. God was using it to plant seeds. Exactly. There was. Well, we're going to pause there. Our guest is Joshua Bowman. Let's take a break and we'll pick up uh, where he's starting to have his heart and mind opened by the beauty of music and art and literature. So we'll be back just a moment. Welcome back to The Journey Home. Our guest is Joshua Bowman, thoroughly enjoying uh, uh, our discussion on philosophy, even though neither of us are philosophers, but, we, <laughs> but, but we, we recognize the importance of that and how we're influenced in a culture that most of us are oblivious to how it influences us. Right, yeah, certainly. And I certainly, at, at the time, even though I was reading it and I was immersing myself in it, I didn't really comprehend even how it was shaping my life and the choices that it was leading to. You know, that's the thing, you know, we talk about how smart the devil is, you know. You know, think about Deep Blue, the chess playing computer, can, can think ahead to the end of the game for whatever move you take. And the devil is smarter than that. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. what we're talking about here. There's no move you can make where the devil hasn't already checkmated you. you know, yeah. it's, it's impossible. Yeah, which is interesting that there have been a number of folk 
totally convinced in all that you've said, but by the mercy of God's grace, in the midst of even reading some of the worst stuff, God's grace opens our heart to say, wait a second, th this isn't right. There's something wrong here. Mm -hmm. And you get those little seeds. Is that what was happening to you? Yes, absolutely. I mean, and so that, um, you know, we talk about, you know, the March for Life. Um, and actually, abortion was, in a way, September, we talk about September 11th was a, a big awakening, but then really another sort of moment where I began to question everything that I believed, or my lack of belief, I guess, uh, was at an abortion rally, a pro-abortion rally. Um, you know, after college, I got involved in politics, um, naturally being a classical liberal and very much into individual rights, I considered myself sort of a neoconservative, libertarian kind of Republican. Mm -hmm. uh, more on the, you know, left side of social issues, but very much free markets, you know, laissez-faire capitalism is the way to go. You know, a Ayn Rand, you know, I thought she was great. I thought <laughs> this, is, this is fantastic. This is a perfect world, right? Well, so I went, I went to um, an abortion rally with some liberal friends just to show, oh, you know, look how open-minded I am. I'm a Republican, but I'm pro-choice. Like, look at me. I'm just, I'm just so smart. I've, and it was, um, it was shocking. I, you know, had not really confronted this in a, a real way. You know, I just said, oh, well, I'm not a woman. It's none of my business. But then there was one of the speakers from, he was from the Sierra Club. He was their president, I guess, and he got up on the stage and he was just going on and on about this eugenics, population control, all this stuff. He said, very animated, he said, we don't want fewer abortions, we want more abortions. And I, whoa, well, that's certainly a position. It's not, not <laughs> shying away from controversy here. And I said, that's, that's not what I want. I don't think we want more abortions. And then as we marched around, there was, of course, one of the groups with the graphic images. And, you know, I still have mixed feelings about that, especially at pro-life rallies when you have small children around. Yeah. You know, it's, it's very disturbing. But I will say that it, it did affect me as someone who was pro-choice. And just having heard, we, we want more of this, more of this. And I saw those images and I said, no, that's not something we want more of. You know, especially, you know, these, these, these late-term abortions, you know, where it's, I mean, it's a baby. It's a baby from the moment of conception, of course, but, you know, we can fool ourselves and saying, oh, well, you know, it doesn't have a heartbeat or it's unable to function outside the womb. You know, we can set up these artificial boundaries of what is, what is life, right? Well, the graphic images make it very clear this is a person that you're destroying. And, and so I had to confront that I, and sort of shrugged it off. I said, well, you know, I would never want to have an abortion or, you know, not encourage someone to have an abortion. I'm just letting other people make their decisions, right? So I still sort of wiggled my way out of responsibility for this, which is really, you know, the, the sadly, it is the, the worst slaughter in the history of the world. I mean, you're talking about 50 million people in America alone. Maybe a, a, I, one figure is perhaps a billion people have been murdered by abortion worldwide mm. since maybe since the, the, since the 80s, I guess we'll say. I mean, it's especially in China, you know, you look at their one child policy and you look at the, there's, there was a story in India um, s several weeks ago about there were some women who were they died in a sterilization facility. I mean, it's just yeah. the slaughter is is epic in scale, and and I think we use the word tragedy carelessly to describe things that are not really that tragic. Like your favorite team loses a game <laughs> in a sporting event. That's not a tragedy. the The slaughter of abortion is a real tragedy, um, and so we talk about the philosophy that this world is immersed in and you know this careless attitude towards eugenics and i think that's really a, a lot of the momentum that we see here in the, the pro-choice movement is just 
these these ideas that are very difficult com- to combat, especially because you know they're very seductive, uh, and they've been working at it for a while. You know, they've refined their arguments to say, oh, well, it's not about abortion; it's about mammograms. We want to give women mammograms, so it's not about abortion. No, no, no. You know, they don't even want to talk about it now because they know it's it's a losing issue. Though sometimes the statement of a very radically bold perspective in the end makes people feel more comfortable about where they are. I mean, I remember when gas was only 55 cents a gallon. Right. And when it got to a dollar, we were shocked. Right. But then we were at least happy with it going to 80. Right. And yeah. then when it got to two, we were shocked. And then we were happy, well, at least it's only 150. Right. So recently it's been up to four. Well, now we're right. really happy with it around three. We become numbed. Yeah. And that's true. The, you know, you have the pro-abortion fringes of the left who are, I mean, just really out there. Like you have these, uh, these atheists who say, you know, abortion is just the beginning. Why, why not have infanticide? Why not have euthanasia? You know, just, just kill everyone. Why do we have to limit it to inside the womb? You know, there's this very sad s- statistic. I, I saw that, that in the Netherlands, where they have euthanasia is, uh, is legal now, you know, there's, there's hundreds of, perhaps thousands of elderly people who have been killed, uh, you know, legally with their consent. I don't know, but they have the dementia. So how could they possibly yeah. legally know what is being asked of them? to consent to this. I mean, th- these are very troubling eth- ethical issues, yeah. even if you don't respect the, the Catholic teaching of life and t- from conception to natural death. Even if you, you know, you maybe have some wiggle room on the ends there, I mean, these are very troubling ethical questions of how could somebody possibly consent to, to die when they're in an altered mental state, when they're not even necessarily aware of their surroundings. Yeah. Um, and they may be suffering from depression. They may be suffering from other other things as well, uh, that warp that warp your mind, that you know warp reality. Um, and again, we talk about you know my view of the world was that reason conquers all, but our reason is so easily overruled by the failings of our body. You know, it's. This, this computer that sits up bet- between our ears is, is not a flawless machine. It's a very good machine, but it, it can very easily break down. And we see, it, we see it all the time. And so at this point in your life, that your conscience was starting to be pricked by some of these bold it, statements. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, you, know, you, you look at these you know, very real evils in the world and I, I had accepted at this point that, you know, that the devil is real and that he is, mm. you know, abroad in the land, as it says. Um, and so it was sort of happenstance that I, you know, because I was in politics, I uh, just happened to, I was working on a campaign and somebody had left a copy of Russell Kirk, The Conservative Mind, which is a great synopsis, I should yeah. say of conservative thought from Burke to Santa Ana. Um, and, you know, being a very Burkean, pragmatic, Whig kind of guy, I started off the book, I was like, oh, okay, well, this is like, you know, this is interesting. And, but then, you know, I got into a lot of the early strains of conservative thought and I was very horrified, you know, they thought these, these ideas are of, very, very in opposition to, you know, everything that I, America is built on, this very, you know, enlightenment kind of thinking, you know, that in fact, the founders of America were products of the enlightenment, to be sure, but they also saw its evils. You know, Burke saw when the, uh, the, the Puritans killed uh, King Charles, you know, that was a very big event, not just in British history, but our history, because we were Britain. You know, the people in the United States were also horrified by this. And in fact, the the, the founding fathers, being sort of the landed aristocracy uh, in the North American colonies, were were very you know c- 
concerned about this, and they they saw that this was a dangerous precedent, and and that's why we have the system that we do, where there is a strong executive, but there's also checks on the power of the of the federal government. You know, these checks and balances are there to prevent things from escalating to this point where the people take over or the legislature takes over, you know, that you need to have a balance. So these ideas got me really thinking and questioning everything I believed as well from a more intellectual standpoint. Um, and then as I got through the book, I, I noticed that there was less and less that made me upset and more and more that I sympathized with. And it really was a change. I mean, it was very drastic. The first half, I, I lent him a friend the copy of the book, uh, so he's probably dog-eared some more pages. But when I, when I gave it to him, the first half of the book had nothing dog-eared, and the second half of the book was just more and more and more. Kind of, you could see, like, whereas I was getting into it and really, like, starting to grip me. Um, and through this, I started, to, you know, obviously, you know, we, we talk about the Founding Fathers, they were mostly Protestants, um, and so I began to have a sense of pride in the Protestant contribution to American history and the, the, the effect of religion in the founding of our country. Um, so I was sort of serendipitously, a friend of mine who's actually Jewish, uh, she was uh, in a choir though at an Anglican Episcopal parish. Uh, but they, I guess they, they paid to have professional singers. Right. Uh, and she mentioned that she was singing uh, Evensong. Uh, and it was, the, it was the Feast of All Saints. Um, and so I said, well, that sounds, that sounds really cool. And so I went and, you know, to hear her sing, but it was a service. You know, it was actually more than just Evensong. It was actually a full service. And... Um, we got to the credo and I said the words, I said, I believe in Jesus Christ, the son of God. And I sort of had chills go up my spine. I said, well, I, I do. What am I saying? I, I do believe in Jesus Christ. And it was, it was just sort of apropos of nothing. I just suddenly I said these words without even meaning to, it just came out. And then I said, this is, this is spectacular. It was it was very liberating, and just I was you know this church is it's really interesting. It's in the middle of a, a graveyard, and so here we are on the feast of all saints, surrounded by our beloved dead, and then the deacon got up to to, to say this homily about the um, the communion of saints, and you know how we'll be reunited with with each other in in fellowship and all this this wonderful stuff and it, you know that crisis that had begun so many years earlier about death and about you know the hereafter <laughs> sort of just all was fell into place you know suddenly this very very serendipitous way a lot of my questions that I didn't even know I was really struggling with all this time about death had suddenly been answered. And it, it was just this amazing feeling of peace yeah. came over me that, you know, I don't need to worry about all this stuff. I don't have to be a philosopher. I don't have to, I don't have to be the pillar of reason if I just let Jesus take care of it. And so that, you know, obviously I still had a long road to travel, but this was really the turning point um, where I accepted that God is real and he's in our lives today and that that he is helping us in the battle against Satan that he's with us and gives us what we need um, and I was able to finally accept that for the first time all those seeds planted back there by the Sunday school teachers came alive <laughs> yes you know it's it's amazing that sometimes it takes a while yeah um, so after that I started to attend services somewhat irregularly. I wasn't really committed or anything like that, but I, I was, you know, I would go 
to the Falls Church, which I was living in Falls Church, which is named after the parish. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I preferred the more traditional services there. And, you know, that was, in a way, sort of awakened me to a lot of new questions. You know, what, so when, when I say, you know, I believe in all the other things besides Jesus, you know, what does that really mean? And we talk about the communion of saints. What is the, com what is Eucharist? What is that? What does that mean? And so, you know, I had a lot of Catholic friends who would, you know, we'd, we'd hang out and go out drinking and, and really I started to ask them a lot of these questions about, you know, what is, you know, what, what, what do you believe as a Catholic about this stuff? And I didn't really even know necessarily what I believed as, an, as a nominal Episcopalian, Anglican, you know, I didn't really even have a clear picture of what I was, the full, you know, theological implications. I just knew that I was onto something here. And so as I had more conversations with my Catholic friends, uh, really the Eucharist was the heart of the matter. And that is, you know, ultimately the, the big division between the, the Anglicans and, and Catholics is the, you know, the validity of the sacraments. Um, because unfortunately, during the Reformation, the Anglicans changed the rites yeah. and they changed a lot of the, the, the words to, that are used for the laying on of hands and, and the apostolic succession, it was rendered invalid. And so the sacraments that are administered by the Anglican Church are not valid for the Catholic Church. They're, they're not just in schism, they are heretics, sadly. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that really though, I was thinking, you know, well, if I want the Eucharist, if I want the communion of saints, I want what's real, you know, I want, I want to do this all the way. So that's when, and then sort of another serendipitous event, I, I met the woman who would later become my wife, and she was raised Catholic, and she was going through a reversion of her own. And she had just, you know, recently started attending Mass every week. And she said, you know, you should, you should come to Mass with me. We should start going to Mass every week and, like, make a point of this. And, you know, neither of us was in any disposition to receive the Eucharist. You know, we, we would stay in the pews. And um, I just kind of thought, this is, I mean, this is very familiar to me from my childhood, you know, and from a more traditional Anglican worship. Uh, it's very similar. There's only a few minor differences here and there. And, you know, when it came time, uh, I started RCIA, you know, I just thought, well, this is, this is the way to go here. So, um, that, you know, learning what I really believed and, you know, as part of RCIA, you know, everyone in the class is coming from different, different Protestant denominations. You know, so you have some people who are maybe agnostic, although I don't think any of the agnostics in my class ended up coming to the church. But we had some really great Protestants who were very solid on scripture. And they, you know, they were really, you know, you know, much more ardent for their faith than I was as a Protestant. And they... You know, it was really great as sort of a comparative religion kind of exercise mm. to learn what the Anglican Church taught. And then the, the Catholic Church is like, well, that's really kind of, if, you're, if you read what Anglican teachings are, it's pretty much the same, just a few minor differences. And I said, well, hey, that's great. I, I, I've, I'm already ready. Let's, let's do this, you know. It, so it, um, when we got to Lent and, you know, we got to that discernment, the priests, you know, met with every one of us and he said, you know, do you have any questions? And I said, no, I, I don't have any questions. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm ready to do this. Um, but of course, before I could do that, I had to confess all my sins. And that scared me. I mean, that was, you know, people, even Catholics, a lot of times are afraid to go to confession because they see it as, a, you know, a judgment. And it is, it is a judgment, but it's mercy. You know, when you willingly confess your sins, it doesn't matter how bad they are, God is merciful and he will 
will provide healing. Um, and so, you know, again, is this, this very beautiful moment, I, as I started my confession, um, you know, I was very nervous, I was sweating profusely and trembling, and then as I, as I got on through, you know, all the terrible things I had done, you know, rejecting Christ and all this stuff, and just the, the weight was lifting from my shoulders. And just to tell the priest this, and he, he was very, very, just very calm. And he didn't say anything. He didn't, he wasn't like, oh, oh my goodness, you can't be Catholic. You know, he was just very nice. And it, it was just so liberating. You know, in, in, in that earlier feeling I had when I professed the creed for the first time in so many years, you know, it was like that, but just even more so to just say, like, Yes, I'm a sinner, but there's still hope. There's still hope here. And so, you know, he gave me my penance, and I went down the cloister. We were at this retreat. It's a uh, beautiful monastery, high in the mountains. And uh, I went to go down the cloister to the chapel and, you know, did my penance. And I just sat there, well, knelt. Uh, I just knelt there for you know, half an hour. I it just, people came and went you know, other people from my class doing their penance. And I just sort of stayed there and I said, this is, this is awesome. Like, <laughs> like Jesus is right here and he's just like welcoming me in. And, and that, I mean, obviously the sacrament of confirmation came later, but the, I mean, the, the sacrament of confession is very real. I mean, that is a life-changing moment for me is to, to, to say that for the first time and to really truly be sorry for everything that I'd done was just the just the, one of the most glorious moments of my life you know short of you know my children being born of course but you know I mean just a wonderful thing so you know after that um, you know obviously confirmed in the church um, and then you know just the zeal for the church has only grown uh, you know when I first converted I was sort of apprehensive about saying the rosary. I'm like, oh, I don't know, that's, what is, what's the rosary? What's that all about? And now, you know, every night I say a decade with my son, my two, year, my two and a half year old son, and he just loves it. I mean, he's, he's like, say, say different prayers, say more prayers. You know, he just eats this stuff up. And it's just like, this is, this is so wonderful to like be able to now share this with my children and to like, you know, grow in my own prayers and to, you know, really put my life in, in, in God's hands is just been, you know, such a wonderful um, transformation in my life. Uh, Josh, I want to make sure to mention that you're connected with um, CatholicVote.org. Yes. So, if, yeah. Because we're, we're, we're a couple minutes left. I want to make sure you have something. Yeah. How, how has that been an expression of your journey? In a way? So, yeah. So, you know, as, as sort of uh, as a convert, you know, I, I think it's, it's wonderful that now I'm, I'm very fortunate to be able to write blogging um, for the Catholic Vote Project. Uh, we, we have a lot of great writers and we cover things from the culture and you know, pop, you know, popular culture, and you know, just the media, and also you know, theology to some extent, and really with a goal of engaging as faithful Catholics, you know, how we can influence the culture and how we can influence politics to you know to 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 be more respectful of life and to change the laws, to give. These, these, these so many stories like mine you know, that you have on your program here, yeah. you know, these people are all trying very hard to grow in faith, and you know a lot of Catholics who have maybe have lapsed and come back to the church, or maybe they have been faithful Catholics all their lives, and there's just there's more they can do, um, and you know our culture does not make that easy to do that. So I think, well, I was going to say your own journey points out that that. We can be caught up in certain idealisms right. that are wrong, but we yeah. can be blind to the fact that we've been uh, sucked into those uh, idealisms. But it was by grace that God opened your heart to see that and to bring you out. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the thing is, I think you know, whether it's in music or 
you know, literature or, you know, the arts, whatever it is, there's so many ways that we can plant those seeds and, and help people to have that conversion of heart. Um, and I think that's my, my mission now. And one of the great ways to do that is to tell how God has touched our lives. Exactly. Which, which you've just done, which, And so thank you for the opportunity. Oh, thank you, Joshua. And I'll tell the audience that uh, his whole conversion story is available in the Coming Home Network newsletter, which you can get at our website, which you can see on the set. Joshua, thank you for thank sharing you. with us this time on, on the journey home. And thank you for joining us. And I do pray that Joshua's journey is an encouragement to you. God bless you.